Let's start with this Nebraska sub-regional and kicking it off is Texas State, a team that has played more than anyone else this season. And I'm talking to a man who has covered more than anyone else this season. It feels like, what, 38 matches? It's Lucas Haskins, the broadcast production manager at Texas State for ESPN. Lucas, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, happy to be here. This is, thank you so much for this opportunity. No, it's it's great. I think there's an, an absolutely you know, massive spot here leading up into the tournament where so many fans want to know what this team is and what's a good player for this team. And, and Texas State is one of those darlings leading into this tournament that everyone's kind of buzzing about because of their most recent game. You know, the end of the season with Baylor comes back from a, a three set loss to the Bears to knock them off. You know, you might say one thing or the other about incentive. But when you've got two teams that are playing in the same state, near the same area, you may be seeing the Baylor Bears in a couple of weeks anyways, if Texas State plays well enough. Yeah, you know, um, it's it, it's fun to have the opportunity that Texas State has had this spring. Um, you know, they've played Texas twice. They have played Baylor twice. They played TCU. They played Kansas. You know, they've, they've basically been a de facto member of the Big 12. And like you said, you know, to play these fantastic programs in state, especially Austin, just 30 minutes up the road. Um, it's great. You know, and it reminds people that, you know, yeah, sure. You got two big top tier programs here that grab all the attention and headlines. But you also have a three time, you know, defending conference champion here in, in Texas State. Uh, you have a school that has been, you know, has been a volleyball school for many a year. Uh, uh, you had a 40 year head coach here, Karen Chisholm, you know, a, a true kind of pioneer in the industry. And so, you know, they play some good volleyball here in San Marcos as well. And, you know, we may, they may not be as tall, they may not be as fast, they may not jump as high, but they play good disciplined volleyball. And, uh, you know, to, to have that opportunity to be in Waco and get that win, that was huge. Um, and I'll tell you, I know I've had, spent a lot of time around this team, a lot of time around this coach. 30, 30 wins was a goal for them all year long. They are big about goals. Um, and 30 was a number that they wanted to land on. Um, and they dropped a, a match to North Texas early this spring that um, I think they didn't want to drop. And they knew that they were going to have to pick up that win elsewhere. And it came down to the last game of the season, 29 wins they were sitting on. And who do you go to but top 10 Baylor and Yosana Presley. And there they go, win that first set and, you know, go, go home with the victory. And, you know, what a night for them. What a night for this program. And, and what a great way to keep the momentum spinning right into the tournament. Isn't that just a, a storyline meant for television, right? That's fantastic. First 30 win season since 1985. And Coach Hewitt has absolutely built one of those teams that you have to be scared every time you see Texas State on the other side of the court. Three time, you know, consecutive Sun Belt champions, as you mentioned. Tell me about this team, though, because some, you know, casual volleyball fans may look at Janelle Fitzgerald and say, okay, she's a stud, right? 447 kills and hitting over 300. Those are two things that just don't compute to the casual volleyballer. What makes her so good and who around her kind of builds her up? I mean, Janelle is obviously incredible. You know, it's it, it's tough when you kind of look at statistics for this year. This was obviously such a funky year. And you mentioned Texas State having the opportunity to play 38 games. When you look at raw numbers, you know, obviously kills, blocks, assists, digs, they're all going to be really up there for Texas State just because of the volume of games that they've played. But that doesn't take away from, uh, you know, her skill set. And certainly she is 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 one of the fierce players on, on, on this team. But I'll, I'll tell you what. This team lives lives and dies and runs right through their setter, Emily DeWalt. Uh, this girl is, is fantastic. She's a three-time Sunbelt setter of the year. Um, she has won it all three years. She's been in the Sunbelt. Um, if I remember correctly, like 40% of all Sunbelt setter awards given out over the past three years have gone to that. her, including those weekly awards. So she just is phenomenal. I mean, she I think she had 46 the other night in, in – uh, uh, in Waco, she's a double double machine. Um, she plays some defense too. So even get a couple blocks in there and she's got this sneaky little dunk move. I know every setter's got it, but she's got one that just no one can seem to figure out and she'll put them in the back corners too. She won't just dump right under the net. She'll dump it, you know, back to the corners where nobody is and she'll steal a couple points that way too. So, um, really this team kind of runs through her. Um, but you'll see some big names up there too. Caitlin Butner really kind of has come along a lot this year. Um, uh, uh, in the middle is, um, 
uh, oh my goodness, Tierney Scott is has just been so big this spring, um, not just as a blocker, um, which she's, I think, leads the country in in blocks. If she doesn't lead anymore, she's up there second or third, um, but gets a ton of kills as well. And so Emily kind of gets to pick who's the hot hand and decide where to go. And that's one of the things she does so well and that Sean will constantly talk about is she's that coach on the court. She knows who's got it, who doesn't, where the matchup uh, discrepancies are. And, um, you know, this team will run through Emily. That That is for certain. So before we look ahead to Nebraska, which is, you know, sure to be an absolute dandy, can't overlook a Utah Valley team making their first ever trip to the NCAA tournament. That's got to carry a little bit of weight. They swept and upset New Mexico State, a team that always, you know, makes their way through the whack with very little issue. You mentioned North Texas. There are a couple head scratchers when you take a look at these losses for Texas State, UTEP, UT Arlington swept by Kansas, who is a, you know, a big 12 team, but maybe not at the top of the conference. What, what makes them look human at times and, and what could Utah Valley possibly do that could have fans saying up oh, there goes my bracket. Yeah. You know, um, Texas state is, you know, it, it, they are going to serve pass game is just going to be so big for them. Um, getting the other teams out of system and being able to maintain them out of system, especially, especially the Nebraska's, the Baylor's, the Texas's, but even your Utah Valley's, um, you know, that's the times this year that Texas state has really struggled is when they haven't been able to play their kind of game, you know, and, and, and to be able to get out of their game a little bit, play out of system, have some people make plays that don't typically aren't typically asked to make plays um, and, you know, height two on the front line. If, if you've got a front line that can disrupt what, what Texas state wants to do, you know, they can be beat you know obviously you mentioned you know UTEP UTA North Texas there are certainly some head scratchers and you know Texas State I was here for that UTA match I, I covered that game and Texas State was actually had they won that match they would have won um, third consecutive regular season title so there was a lot of pressure on that game and and they didn't win that so Coastal Carolina ended up taking the regular season title for the Sun Belt and um, you know that was something that meant a lot to those girls they wanted to go out that day and win that match and, and they couldn't get it done so you know I think that you know making sure they keep their heads on straight, make sure they, they, they maintain themselves in the moment and play their, their version of volleyball, you know, their brand of volleyball. And obviously when you get to a school like Nebraska, you're, you're not going to be able to play the, the style of game you want to play. And, um, but, you know, hopefully, you know, for Texas state fans playing against, against, uh, you know, Utah Valley, they, they can, they can kind of play their style, you know, and you can see Janelle getting up their double digit kills. You'll see Caitlin Butner getting up their double digit kills. You'll have a couple girls with three or four aces. Emily will have a couple blocks on the front line and a couple kills herself as well. And you'll see this kind of scoring from, from all over the team and, and able to get that, that key 15 to 16 kills a game, uh, you know, that each team needs in order to try to get to 25. And with the two weeks between matches, that first round could be an advantage to some of these teams if they get off to a hot start, Nebraska might be cold to start that second round match. I talked a lot about that in the bracket breakdown and Pepperdine might be situated in the same kind of, you know, sphere where if they dominate UMBC, Baylor might take a little bit to, uh, to loosen up. So we'll have a lot of fun breaking down this bracket. Lucas, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Ah, anytime. He is Lucas Haskins, the broadcast productions manager for ESPN down at Texas State. We're going to move on to Utah Valley. Now for the other side of that Texas State-Utah Valley match, it's time to talk with the voice of the Utah Valley Wolverine volleyball team, Matthew Biamonte. Matt, let's talk Utah Valley with me, man. First time in the NCAA tournament. You've been with the team for a long time. Nobody better to dice it up with than you. What's it like for this program to finally break through and, and get New Mexico State out of there? Oh, man, it's huge. They've been they've – been in the shadow of New Mexico state for so long, they've met them in many a whack championship match and they've never been able to overcome that hurdle. And it was crazy how it all came together. Cause that, that tournament was supposed to take place at New Mexico state, but due to regulations down there, it got moved to Orem three seed. They upset grand Canyon take down New Mexico state, which was a shock that it was a sweep, but they, they were able to do yeah. so. I think they've shown flashes throughout their eight, nine, 10 years in the, in the Western athletic conference. But this year, towards the end of the year, I think they finally all put it together and upset the Aggies. 
Yeah, they split the regular season series with New Mexico State at home, took them in five, and then lost in three. So got that little bit of the rubber match. They beat Grand Canyon in four. But the one real notable match of this season, and it's something that it's it's finally nice to talk to a team that played a little non-conference, and that's that BYU match. It's, it's the real test for Utah Valley. It's probably the closest competition that they're going to face compared to a Texas State or a Nebraska they're going to play at 3.30 Eastern time. It's going to be nice and, and early for, for those out in Orem watching. But, you know, walk me through that that BYU match. That was it at home, correct? So you were on the call. That for was, it. yep, that was a home match. I was on the call. And, and they battled BYU very closely. This team, it's really interesting. Sometimes at the end of, of the end of sets, they can get out of sorts and let things slip away. And that's exactly what happened in that BYU match where through the first 20 points, they, they hung, they hang tough with BYU, but then it just kind of slipped away. And so that's going to be a real challenge for them in this tournament is not letting Texas state go on a five Oh six Oh run, especially late in that set, but they, they competed with BYU and they, they should take something from that saying, Hey, if we can clean up a few things, maybe we shock, uh, shock Texas state. Yeah, they were down 18-17 in the fourth, you know, trying to work their way to force the fifth. It was uh BYU took it in four sets the, the final two sets, like you mentioned, 25-20, 25-20. So talk to me about the identity of this team, right? You know, are they that scrappy club that keeps balls up and might pester a team like Texas State into making mistakes? Yeah, they're really solid defensively. They've got a couple middle blockers that have been outstanding. Uh, Kendra Nock, she, she's one of the unheralded players for Coach Atoa's Wolverine. She does a good job at the net. And then they have uh, on the back row, Saren Jardine, their libero, who this season became the program's all-time leader in digs. So she does an outstanding job of keeping things alive. And then offensively, they try to get Kazna Tanavasa in, into as many opportunities as possible. Uh, she was just named the Conference Player of the Year for the Western Athletic Conference. So she's out – I mean, she's going to probably break the school record for kills. She's really dynamic. And they've got a couple other outside hitters in Kristen Bell and Tori Dorius – who are good as well. So I think it all starts with the, uh, with the serve receive game. It, it comes and goes for them. Uh, certainly a scrappy team, N not the tallest team. Tori Doris is the tallest player at six foot four. Not a, not a ton of players over six feet, six foot one, but they're, they're resilient. So th I think they're going to put up a good fight. So last question here for you, Matthew, what kind of game script do we need to see for Utah Valley to pull off not just one upset, but maybe, you know, put together a, one of those Cinderella runs? They're going to need to serve the ball well. They led the conference in service aces, 109 service aces, 13 better than New Mexico State. In that championship match, they served significantly better than the Aggies. And, and, and when they do so, they create a lot of problems. They have a lot of good freshman servers who can create some havoc. So if they serve the ball well, if their serve to, to air ratio is, I, I don't know, 10 to 2, something like that, then they've got a chance to upset them. But if they have as many uh, service aces as they do airs, then I think it could be a long match. All right, so we'll see. Midday, 3.30 Eastern time start on that Wednesday, the first round. He's Matthew Biamonte, the voice of the Utah Valley volleyball team, the Wolverines. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. No doubt. This region really goes across the country, right? We went from Texas out to Utah. Now we're going to head out to Baltimore and chat UMBC. Down to the bottom half of this sub-regional and to talk UMBC against Pepperdine, we'll start with the Retrievers. And we've got Nick Lawrenson with us, former intern for UMBC Athletics and current writer for Mid-Major Magic and Madness, excuse me. And so Nick, taking a look at this UMBC team, it was, it's been a magical run. I mean, there's no other way to say it. Their first ever America East title, first trip to the tournament since 1998. I'm not even sure how many players were born on this Retrievers team the last time they made the tournament. It was a great comeback win against Albany in the championship. Tell me about this run and this little bit of, uh, of March Madness that we saw from this team that may, uh, may ring true to a lot of UMBC fans from a few years ago that follow the basketball team. Yeah, definitely. That's what makes it great. You said you brought up 1998. A lot of this team, I mean, two of the top three ladies with kills are both freshmen. I mean, they have a couple people at top. Last year, they were 7-16. and 16. They didn't even make the America's tournament. It was an amazing turnaround. 
Now they're first in America. East one regular season. They won the tournament. That amazing comeback against Albany. Uh, Coach Robinson brought in some great transfers. They're all from all over the map. So it's honestly been an amazing run. This team, they're one of the best I've seen in the couple years watching them. So I, mean, I think I think the one thing that stands out here about this team is the fact that when you talk about a lot of these automatic qualifiers, it's usually just one star player that really steals the show. But taking a look at the stats for UMBC, you've got Kumanova with 175 kills and then Van Nord with 178, two others in triple digits. And then the most outstanding player from the tournament is someone who came up big defensively in Paige Krennic, who had 20 digs in the championship and came up with, of course, the 14-13 game-winning kill in the fifth set against Albany. Talk to me about some of the help around maybe one or two star players, or is it really a fully balanced lineup that UMBC is going to bring to the court? It's really a fully balanced because you don't usually see that much uh, diversity within the kills. And you have those four with the over 100, and then you have a couple in the high uh, high double digits. Uh, but, you know, they have – they brought in a transfer from San Diego State, Lauren Teeter. She's having a great season with her digs. Uh, they have the setter of the year in Asia Miller. She's from uh, Hawaii. So, I mean, and then they have Kamani Conti, who's been there for a couple of years. She's kind of like a leader as a junior, I want to say she is. And then you have Krennic, who's also one of the only other people to return from uh, last year's team. So they're really balanced all around. And, yeah, I mean – Yeah, no, I mean, I was going to say, so we can kind of talk about the matchup that we're going to have because Pepperdine is a very talented team, a team that is is somewhat fully balanced, but also has the height that maybe UMBC may be lacking. What is an area of weakness for UMBC? And then, you know, Nick, what is some areas that, that UMBC may really have success in throughout this season? Well, the right side is very good for UMBC, but uh, I feel like definitely up on the blocks, that's going to be difficult. So they're going to have to work on that, especially against a team like Pepperdine, who's West Coast. You know, they always hit very well. So, I mean, you got to work up there close. Yeah, Pepperdine dismantled BYU in their first meeting and then lost in five to the Cougars. They took Baylor, which is the team waiting for this matchup's winner in five sets Pepperdine later in the season, though, you know, San Diego was a team that they split with, and now they'll take on UMBC in an early game, right? I mean, you take a look at at the one advantage that the Retrievers could have is the fact that they're playing noon Eastern time on Wednesday, the 14th, Pepperdine playing at 9 a.m. on their local time, Pacific time. What needs to happen, right? You've seen this UMBC team. You've seen the magic. Last question for you here. What needs to happen? Are there a a couple certain you know, things that need to go your way in, or, in order for UMBC to maybe pull off a big upset? As always in volleyball, you got to take that first set. So, and then after you take that first set, you got to take a large enough lead in that second set to do something. But, you know, just they just got to control the game. I mean, it's going to be tough to be a nationally ranked team. Nationally ranked team. UMBC didn't really have a non-conference this season. They only beat Coppin. And they were to play Virginia. That would have been a good test, but they weren't able to do it. So they got to take control early. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see if UMBC can surprise the volleyball world in a similar way that they were able to shock the basketball world. He's Nick Lawrenson, former intern for UMBC Athletics Department, runs the Instagram page, and also a writer for Mid-Major Madness. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Wrapping up this Nebraska subregion, let's break down the other half of this matchup. It's the Pepperdine volleyball team, and I'm joined by the voice of Pepperdine, Al Epstein. Al, thank you so much for joining me today. Good to be here, Daniel. Excited about uh, women's volleyball and the national tournament. I think it's going to be a great tournament this year. Uh, I think uh, it's wide open. I think there's a lot of parity in women's volleyball, so it's going to be great. Yeah, we were mentioning it with a couple other people. There's no Stanford. There's no Hawaii. Some mm-hmm. of these blue bloods in the college volleyball world, Penn State having an off year, wide open for a team, maybe like Pepperdine, making their 24th trip. The team's been there. The fan base has been there. Walk me through what Scott, what Coach Scott Wong has really put together with this awkward COVID season. 
Well, it has been difficult, not only for Pepperdine, but everybody throughout the country. And I, and I really think that uh, the NCAA, even in uh, professional sports, they have done an incredible job uh, working through this uh, pandemic, uh, navigating through such difficult times. So the effort's been there. It's been great uh, to see, obviously, national basketball championships and getting through college baseball and, and other sports as well. So, uh, and Pepperdine's gone through the same thing. Uh, they've been down a couple times. Uh, Scott Wong is really a, an up-and-coming coach. He's in his, uh, his sixth year. He's a former Pepperdine three-time All-American uh, defense specialist. Uh, and so he really knows the game. He was at Hawaii uh, before he took the Pepperdine job. But uh, being from Pepperdine and being with the school for so many years, uh, it was a natural to have him come and coach Pepperdine Women's Volleyball Program. Sixth year, and, and he's got this team really uh, playing extremely well. What makes them so good, they do a lot of, uh, very, very good things overall. They don't seem to have a lot of weaknesses. They have the power hitters. They're a great ball handling team, and they hold their opponents to just a 184 hitting percentage. So uh, there's not a lot of weaknesses, but I say ball handling is their best, and they've got a lot of experience as well. Well, you mentioned the opponents. It has been a stacked West Coast Conference this season. Al, you've been with the team for a long time. Three teams in the NCAA tournament. A lot of buzz around San Diego and BYU. Pepperdine, a team that is getting a lot of love in this bracket with Rachel Ahrens, right? She is such a superstar. But who are a couple other names for fans to keep an eye on for this run? Well, well, besides Rachel Ahrens, who I thought should have been uh, the West Coast Conference Player of the Year, but because of the way they win the league, uh, she came up short, but she was still first team all conference. But uh, a couple of other players, uh, Shannon Scully, uh, a three time all conference uh, outside hitter, opposite, uh, great server, uh, excellent ball handler. So keep your eye on Shannon Scully. Uh, it's going to be an all American. Uh, the setter, Isabel Zelaya, just a sophomore, ranks number 15 uh, in the nation in assists per set, to almost 11 uh, per set. Uh, another player is Meg Brown, a freshman. Uh, middle blocker who was just named the West Coast Conference Freshman of the Year, 6'3", strong, a uh, great court presence. So again, uh, throughout the team, uh, even Madison Shields, uh, the libero, she was just in the libero uh, of the year in the WCC. But, you know, you talk about the West Coast Conference, and I've always said this might be the strongest mid-major athletic conference in the country. And it's something you realize Gonzaga is the WCC in, in men's basketball and other sports and BYU which is a powerhouse. So, yeah, you know, Pepper and I has been well-tested, too. They've put a lot of good teams. Obviously, the only loss that BYU has suffered has been uh, by Pepper and and that was a sweep, a complete shutout over the Cougars. That was a dominant one. I remember tuning in for that match. Just to put it in perspective for you folks, Rachel Ahrens has five Offensive Player of the Week honors. Pepperdine, as a team, half of the 20 possible weekly honors this season. The next team, BYU with six. There was that dominant three-setter. Now let me ask you, UMBC first. I don't want to look past them, but it's it's definitely a team that Pepperdine should be favored against. A noon Eastern time start, though. So that is 9 a.m. on the West Coast. What might be the plan to try to get these players a little woke up you know, early in the morning? Well, you know, I ask that question uh, to coaches all the time. Uh, you know, they'll probably arrive a couple of days early just to adjust uh, to the time frame uh, and uh, probably not a lot of different things. I was still going to have to get up a little bit earlier uh, to get ready for the game, uh, an early morning start. But, uh, you know, I think they'll be refreshed. Uh, they'll get to bed early. There will be uh, uh, mandated to be in bed or in your room by 10 p.m. Uh, they'll eat a light breakfast uh, and, and ready to go. I think they'll be refreshed. And you're right, you can't, you can't look past anyone in this tournament. Uh, if they can get by Maryland, Baltimore County, then Baylor, who they already played this year uh, in Waco and took them to five. Uh, that was back in December after Pepperdine had played Brigham Young in two very tough matches. So they are well-tested. They've also beaten San Diego as well. So uh, the WCC is strong, and I think they're prepared to make a great run in this tournament. Yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to talk to you about. Baylor, in my opinion, one of the strongest 12 seeds we have seen in the last few years. Anytime you've got a team that went to the Final Four last year as the one seed, the overall one seed, only losing one player in Shelly Stafford, mainly out of that front mm -hmm. line. But Pepperdine missed the tournament in 2019, beat Northern Iowa in the first round, and took Wisconsin to four sets a few years ago. Do you think playing Baylor and really taking them the distance this season could lead to more confidence from the players on Pepperdine? Well, I think so. I think it's a confident team that has a lot of talent and a great amount of depth. So 
they're well coached. Uh, they're, they're well tested this year. So, you know, I think the parity in women's volleyball has, has grown a great deal over the last several seasons. Uh, you know, you have 20 teams that maybe can win this thing. And, and obviously Wisconsin and the Big Ten uh, is well represented in this uh, in this tournament. So if Purdue is one of the, the better teams. So I, I think it's going to be a great, uh, a great tournament this year. I'm looking forward to watching it. Uh, unfortunately, there's no radio from Pepperdine where they're not going out there. So but we'll enjoy it from afar. It'll be the first match of the day on that Wednesday. He's the voice of Pepperdine, Al Epstein. Thank you so much for joining me. Daniel, great to talk with you, and uh, good luck to Purdue, and good luck to the Go Waves. That's all I can say. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're going to be starting up soon. This is going to wrap up our coverage, the final first-round match of this first-round coverage, so I hope you guys enjoyed all of it. We went through all eight sub-regions. This is the Nebraska and Baylor one, and Pepperdine will be up soon. This should be posted just before that first serve on that Wednesday, so Hopefully, Al, you can enjoy the match and everyone at home will enjoy it as well. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Daniel Gilman.